On to our, our main speaker, David Hughes. Um, we're delighted to have him. He's come over specially from Sheffield. Um, this man is a comet expert. There are very few of those around. Okay? So much so that a comet has actually been named David Hughes. Um, in this year of International Year of Astronomy, we're celebrating uh, Galileo not necessarily inventing the telescope, but looking through it. We're at a junction in our own physics courses where astronomy will be, hopefully, introduced. Okay? And today there's a sort of miniature theme of astronomy running through it. Uh, we have later on the workshop from Rob Hill. Okay, so without me, you don't want to hear me talk anymore. I want to hand over to David. Please give him a nice warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. I, uh, I really enjoyed coming here to Ireland. It's not my first time, but a lovely spot. I'm going to chat to you today about telescopes, how they were produced, and uh, how they're being used and how we are all, we being the taxpayers, paying lots and lots of money for big telescopes. And you've already heard that 2009 is the International Year of Astronomy. And in 1609, Galileo used a telescope astronomically for the first time. You quite often read about Thomas Harriot in England supposedly inventing the telescope. Forget it. I mean, Thomas Harriot, bless him, he was a mathematician. He had a cushy job. He worked for the Earl of Northumberland. And he looked through a telescope. He drew a little picture of the moon and then forgot it. He didn't publish his results. Whereas Galileo was a proper scientist. And here you have a man who wanted a telescope. So very fortunately, he was in the right place. He was in Florence, where people were very good with lenses, and uh, he got his technician and himself to make a telescope. Not only did he use it, he observed the moon, he observed Venus, he observed the sun, he observed Jupiter, he wrote up his results, he published his results, he sold his publication, all before the end of March 1610. Now, before I really get going about telescopes, let me just say that the introduction of the telescope to science was a seriously major event. This date, 1609, was an absolute watershed. Before that date, humans, us, scientifically, could only use the five senses. And so, if we couldn't smell it, taste it, feel it, hear it, or see it, it didn't exist. You then get, in 1609, this instrument, the telescope, which suddenly changes the ability of humans to see things. I mean, look, we all use our eyes all the time, and we know that we're stuck with a maximum pupil size of five millimeters. And if it doesn't go through these five millimeters, tough, you don't detect it. We're also stuck with a minimum resolution of one minute of arc. I mean, outside the hotel window last night was the quartered moon, a lovely sight in the sky. This, of course, subtends half a degree at the eye. You hold your finger up. That subtends one and a half degrees at the eye. You can cover your moon up three times with your extended finger. But with the eye, all you can do is resolve a minute of arc. The moon is 30 minutes of arc across. And so before 1610, this just tells you how limited our observations were. We're also stuck with the fact that the brain-eye combination sees a picture about every 24th of a second and then it sees another picture, and then it adds these all together. But as soon as the telescope came along, let's face it, the telescope is a marvellous piece of kit. I always say to my students, in essence it does three or four jobs. One of the major jobs the telescope does is act 
as a light bucket. So if you've got a big telescope that far across, you collect up the light that hits the whole diameter of that lens or mirror. And of course, you can then funnel that light into the eye. And you can see things which are too faint for the eye to detect. And this, of course, was amazing. In 1609, Galileo, for example, looked through the telescope and realized that there weren't just the 4,000 stars that you can see in the sky. There were more. And so Galileo said, well, why did God make things that we can't see? And this philosophical discussion started going. And I shall be telling you later on that we got so keen on the telescope as a light bucket that we have been quite happily increasing the diameter of the biggest telescope on planet Earth by a factor of two every 50 years. And has, as yet, nothing has stopped us doing this. Well, of course, the other thing that a telescope acts as is a magnifying lens. This one minute resolution is completely knocked on the head by telescopes. And of course, with the biggest telescope on Earth and the Hubble, you can get superb stellar resolution. And as you've been wandering around outside, you've been seeing some of the pickies that have come back from Hubble. I mean, the Whirlpool Galaxy, for example. You just look at that Hubble picture today, and you're seeing something which is about 18,000 pixels by about uh, 5,000 pixels across. And you're seeing a beautiful image, which well, let's face it, in 1773, the Whirlpool Galaxy was discovered for the first time. Six years later, they realized that it wasn't one galaxy, it was two. And then here in Ireland, up the road in County Offaly, they actually drew these wonderful spirals that you can see in that galaxy. And this is all down to actual telescopes. And then the third thing that a telescope can do is measure position. And here again, in astronomy, the use of telescopes to measure where stars are has been very, very important. As, for example, the Earth moves around the solar system every year, within a six-month period, the Earth moves 300 million kilometers. And of course, this makes nearby stars wobble about in the sky, but only by about a second of arc. And early telescopes couldn't detect this. And so people kept saying, well, are you sure the Earth is moving around the sun? I'm standing here. I don't feel it moving around the sun. And so Galileo used to get into these great big arguments. But as telescopes got better and better and better, we suddenly got to a stage where people could say, oh, we're just able to detect this. And so we could then do something which in astronomy is absolutely vital and that is measure distance between us and stars and come up with silly facts like, you know, in our neck of the galaxy, the average distance between stellar systems is you know, seven light years. We can come, we can look at the Whirlpool galaxy in the sky and not say, oh, isn't that fascinating? We can also simply tell you that that is 150,000 light years away. And so you suddenly realize that what you're looking at is of a certain size and has a certain number of stars. And this, needless to say, is a vital business. <laughs> <laughs>